the aesthetics on the uh, bumper music, uh, obviously. But uh, we decided it was important to rush to get on the air, given the nature of the world emergency. Uh, Today, this morning, the North Korean government has threatened uh, the Obama regime with thermonuclear war. And that may be... um, that may be uh, a, an empty bluff, but uh, it may also have something more to it. And for sure, tomorrow, Wednesday, Barack Obama will declare war on the economic rights of the American people. The economic rights that were dearly bought through centuries of political and labor struggle. The basic apparatus of civilization, which every advanced country in the world has. That is to say, a social security or pension system with disability benefits, and this includes vet, vet, veterans' benefits and benefits for others who uh, are not able to work uh, in the usual way, and of course the medical care, which uh, in this country is only available automatically to people over 65 if they qualify for the program. Obama will be attacking those rights tomorrow. This is a tremendous political watershed. It is the first time since the passage of the Social Security Act in 1935 that as a Democratic president, so-called, in this case a Wall Street puppet, has dared to launch a frontal attack against the two pillars of the social safety net, such as we have, which everyone in the middle class, everybody who works for a living, even the poor, can expect to fall back on, in particular in their old age, but also any time they are maimed, injured, unable to work. The Social Security Act of 1935 and the Medicare Act of 1967. Obama will be attacking them starting tomorrow. Now, a couple of words about this program. Why this program? You may be familiar with another broadcast that I do on another network. You can catch up with that at tarpley.net. Tarpley.net is the touchstone for everything. Uh, I find again and again, if you don't read tarpley.net, you simply do not know what is happening in today's world. Uh, There's another radio broadcast, which is a two-hour broadcast recorded at 1 p.m. Eastern Friday afternoon. Given the fast pace of world events, it's essential to supplement that now with at least one hour of uh, analysis, to some extent news, at the beginning of the week. However, this is not a program that is in the business of offering opinions and analysis or complaining only. It is a program which is focused on action. Mass mobilization is the goal. If you're looking for mass mobilization and meaningful action, you came to the right place. And we'll be back in just a minute on the Webster Tarpley program. Welcome back to the premiere edition of the Webster Tarpley program here on UnboundRadio.com. We'll give you a little analysis on the Unbound, the reference, obviously, to Prometheus Unbound by Percy Bysshe. Shelley, and the basic idea is that uh, we're for technology and science and against oligarchy. That is an underlying feature of the name of the network, and I can describe that for you in some detail in the coming weeks when we have a little bit more time, but it's Promethean, and Promethean is fighting oligarchy. That's the uh, subtext of just about everything. If you're not fighting bankers, you are spinning your wheels. If you're fighting the government rather than the, uh, the bankers, you're spinning your wheels. You better go after the Torero, the Matador, not the Cape. Don't be a sucker. Don't fall for the anti-government libertarian line financed by David Rockefeller, Peter Thiel of the Bilderberger Group, and so on down the line. Right? That stuff has been uh, done to death. But again, why this program? Commentary is a dime a dozen. Mere analysis is a dime a dozen. Do you need to be told that things are bad? Do you need to be told that there's a depression? I hope not. Do you need to know, you need to be told that the media are corrupt? You don't, we don't need to belabor that point. That the political parties are worse than useless? 
that a political alternative is required. I hope you understand that part, that we need a third political force independent of the Republicans and the Democrats. And don't tell me the Paul Tards, the Ron Pauls and the Rand Pauls and the uh, Senator Toomey's and Cruz's and uh, Rubio's of the world that they're some kind of an independent force. That is the nerve and fist of the reactionary to fascist Republican Party. As we're going to see tomorrow, and as I'll be foreshadowing here today, because the details are now known, the Wall Street Democrats are almost as bad. The only difference is how fast do they send you into the next world? The Republican approach is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Romney, if Romney had won the election last year, we would have been facing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the entitlements at this point, the shredding of the social safety net all at once within a couple of months. Well, we were able to avoid that uh, outcome. But now we're facing Obama, different proposition. Obama's method, dissembling, deception, trickery, doping people. And his method is slower. At the same time, it generates less resistance. That is the advantage of this for the ruling class. As long as they can accept the idea of a slower demolition, then Obama offers tremendous economies. He keeps the system going, which has immense cash value for the Wall Street oligarchies uh, who are the, the enemy. So it's the death by a thousand cuts. It's the uh, method of letting it all wither on the vine. Uh, so that's coming up. So what we're interested in doing is offering solutions, not complaints, not analysis, although some analysis, of course, is, is required. But the main issue now is to provide an alternative, an organizing alternative. We're all about activism. In particular, I have been associated now in the last year or two with the United Front Against Austerity. The great issue of the world in our time is austerity. The bankers, the zombie bankers, the hedge fund hyenas, the Wall Street oligarchs, the city of London, Wall Street, the rest of them, they brought on this depression. We are now in a world economic depression of unimaginable proportions, similar to the 1930s, in many ways worse than the 1930s. A depression of this dimension is an expensive proposition. Depressions cost five trillion, 10 trillion, 15 trillion in economic value destroyed. It's got the sky's the limit because it's, it doesn't end. Who's gonna pay for that? Oh, our dear friends from Wall Street have an immediate proposition. Working people get to pay. And Obama clicks his heels and says, yes, we're gonna cut Social Security and Medicare, and he's already been doing it. And the Republicans try to elbow in and say, no, we can do it quicker and more brutally and better. That's a real Hobson's choice. But our proposal is different. We say, no, the finance oligarchs, zombie bankers, and hedge fund hyenas who started this depression, who are responsible for it with their lunatic notions of deregulation, the deregulation of derivatives, the abolition of the Commodity Exchange Act of 1936, the ab abolition of Glass-Steagall and so forth, and through their privatization, the privatization of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and so many other uh, former government institutions, privatization of large parts of the economy, they get to pay. We want to take it out of their hide, not our hide. So we say 1% Wall Street sales tax. We say this to people on the, on the right. Oh, if you're a libertarian, you don't like Wall Street, huh? Well, let's see that in action. Let's not see you out there as a useful idiot, a dupe and a shill for Wall Street's austerity policies, which you think is anti-big government. Because yet that comes out of the hide of the American people more than out of the hide of any government. And to our dear friends over at Occupy, those who have fallen under the realm of, uh, under the rule of the anarchists from ad busters and so forth. Uh, what are you going to do? Complain about Wall Street until the end of time? Where's your action program? How about hitting them where it hurts? 
How about hitting them in the La Banza? 1% of all their flash trading, program trading, high frequency trading, 1% of all of their derivatives, stocks, bonds, futures, options, indices, and so forth. Uh, that will stabilize the federal budget. At that point, the need for austerity disappears. The word austerity is canceled from the language, except as a vile curse, as a, a residue of the barbaric past, a relic of barbarism. So we're against austerity, and we're into making Wall Street pay, not just loading them with insults and abuse, but making them cough up. So that's our uh, approach. It's programmatic. We know what to do. We're interested in the Wall Street sales tax. The other point is, beyond that, if you want to have an economic recovery, you've got to get the richest part of the government under your control. The richest part of your government is obviously the Federal Reserve. And we don't want to end the Fed. We want to seize the Fed. We want to take it over. There's a credit generating power in there, which is measured in the tens of trillions of dollars. And if you have empty factories, and we do, and if you have unemployed skilled workers or unemployed workers who can acquire skills, and we do, well, all you need then is money. The political fiction of money to put those together and get a recovery of awesome proportions. Full employment. Ever hear of that? It's within your reach. Anytime you want to stop messing around with Occupy or the Paul Tards or whatever you've been wasting your time on, get into action with the United Front Against Austerity. You'll be part of a movement that says, in effect, let's seize control of the Federal Reserve. Let's nationalize it, deprivatize it, federalize it, seize it any way you want to put it, in whole or in part. If you're not strong enough to get the whole thing, just one little window will do it, right? One little window with a mere three to four trillion and the recovery begins to take off. And at that point, all the demagogues get cut off at the knees because people who thrive on despair, unemployment, heteronomy and all that, they cannot exist in a climate of optimism, which is 30 million jobs for the United States. Openers. 30 million new productive jobs at union wages. Davis Bacon union wages. As you can hear, we're pro-labor. We're different from the Paul Tards, the Republican Party, who want to bust every union. And of course, there again, Obama says, don't do it in such a crude, open way. Don't do it like Walker in Wisconsin or Snyder in Michigan. He doesn't do anything to stop them. Or Mitch Daniels in Indiana or Kasich in Ohio tried it too. Obama says, look, I can destroy those unions on the installment plan. I'll do it gradually, piece by piece. So Wall Street support me. That's, that's the one that we have to deal with right now. So in the States, this is the policy of Mussolini and Hitler. What was the first thing Mussolini and Hitler did when they seized power? 1922, more or less. 1933 in Germany, bust every union, shut down every union. And if you tell me you don't like unions, you don't like the people involved, this is a structural question. As long as the only power center in the society is banks, the banks will control the government. As soon as they are, there are unions, no matter how corrupt they are, it doesn't matter. It's the Wall Street. Nobody's going to outtop Wall Street in corruption. But the presence of those unions is a structural break, counterweight to the exorbitant power and abuse of the system by Wall Street. So you got to get organized. Um, trade union action is not enough. And the, tr the trade unions right now are all sold out to Obama. Nobody knows that better than me. On the other hand, uh, part of their abuse is that they're so weak. A lot of their crimes grow out of the fact that they're so weak. So along comes little Rand Paul, son of Ron Paul, and he wants to wipe out every union. And Mitch Daniels, and that was Romney too, a nationwide right-to-work law that would destroy every Union. Well, that's another part of the apparatus of civilization. Working people have got to be represented in the workplace. So 
the general philosophy here is that of the New Deal, the Franklin D. Roosevelt New Deal, in its best moments. This is not an uncritical acceptance of everything, because at the beginning, some of it was wrong. Uh, plowing under crops is not good. We're not for that. We're for parity prices. It took a while for the uh, New Deal to evolve on that, and they were the first ones to admit it, right, that you have to try things and see if they work. So we are now standing on the shoulders of a giant, right, of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who actually worked out a lot of these things. So we can now say this is now a new version of the New Deal uh, with all of the refinements, avoiding all the mistakes. And we can learn a lot from Lend-Lease, and we can learn a lot from the people who tried to stop Hitler in Germany in 1931-32, who said essentially, let's have a massive program of infrastructure. Let's build the Autobahn in 1931 and 1932. Let's suck up 5 million unemployed or more in a vast program of public works, roads, highways, bridges, communications, uh, electrification, and so forth. If that had been done, Hitler would have been cut off at the knees. Uh, but since it wasn't done, <laughs> those highways got built, but uh, they're, uh, they, they got built too late. They got built after the Nazi seizure of, of power. So this is the, uh, the general orientation. Uh, we're not into process reforms. The petty bourgeoisie, I'm afraid, uh, because of their inability to grasp the um, – the nature and the, the tragic depth of this crisis. They say, oh, let's do things like have campaign finance reform, more money for the Securities and Exchange Commission. Let's, um, let's uh, declare that corporations are no longer persons and things like this. this all, some of this is well and good. Uh, even the Glass-Steagall reform, now that the depression has started, uh, becomes a process reform. These process reforms, some of them have uh, merit, some of them have substantial merit, but they are not suitable vehicles for mass organizing. Mass organizing takes mass traction material demands. You have got to imagine the kitchen table issues of this guy that the, the, the mind benders down the road here in Washington, D.C. call Joe Sixpack. Joe Sixpack means the average American worker. Joe Sixpack is struggling for survival, and he can't get interested in whether a corporation is a person right now. He doesn't see the benefit. We'll have more about this in just a minute on the Webster Tarpley program, Unbound Radio. Welcome back to this world premiere edition of the Webster Tarpley program on Unbound Radio. Just a general introduction Couched, of course, in the immediate emergency, threat of thermonuclear war today from Pyongyang, uh, Obama declaring war on the economic rights of the American people tomorrow to strip you of your pension, your health care. And if he can break through on those, no economic right will be safe. Child labor laws, unemployment benefits, none of it going towards absolute barbarism. So. Another important point here, we want to fight for human civilization. We want to fight against barbarism and the descent into a Hobbesian or social Darwinist hell, which is the net outcome of the anarchist program, the Occupy program, as well as the reactionary Republican program. And of course, the Wall Street uh, Democrat program with, with Obama. We are not offering uh, trick gimmick solutions. We're not offering funny money. You hear about funny money, right? We hear about bitcoins. Now, we're not interested in Ponzi schemes or funny money. All of that stuff has been tried. It's, it's amazing how much of that has been tried even in Germany uh, in the pre-Hitler phase. It didn't work and it won't work. Uh, we're not offering toy banks. We're not offering ways to divide uh, a front of struggle into 50 separate state capitals struggling for a toy bank that may eventually uh, pan out in some form or not. 
And we're not offering lifestyle reform either. We're not saying that you can change the planet and the world starting with yourself, your choices as a consumer, what you eat, the medical care you get or don't get. No, we are not lifestyle radicals, lifestyle reformers. The point here is to provide what I must uh, define as revolutionary leadership, reforms that are revolutionary in the sense that they are reforms that make perfect sense in the context of the existing society, but they go far beyond what the existing system can allow. They are reforms that overcome or uh, transform the system into something radically uh, different. So uh, that is uh, some idea of the revolutionary Reforms And again, the Wall Street sales tax, breaking the power of the Wall Street financier oligarchy is a key part of it, and uh, the seizing of parts of the Federal Reserve, also a key part of it. But not funny money. We're not interested in investment advice per se. You have a right to survive, and we can give you some ideas about how to do that. Uh, including in my books, right? You go to tarpley.net, you'll find an array of books. One of them is Surviving the Cataclysm, some advice there about what to do uh, in order to survive economically, personally, because we need you to survive to fight, but not not uh, in the sense of uh, trying to accumulate uh, wealth per se, because that's an illusion uh, if Pyongyang makes good on their story with the thermonuclear war. So um, economic program, and nothing works without a mass movement. If you don't get a mass movement that's political at the highest level, it's got to be national. It better be international. But if it's not national, it's hopeless. Anything local, anything statewide, uh, this will be severely limited. And even a struggle in a state, for example, the struggle against the fascist governor Snyder of Michigan, that's got to be backed up by a worldwide mobilization of exposure denunciation and the rest, which we've uh, contributed to. And we'll have guests on here who are able to describe and, and uh, introduce you to the ways in which that will be, that will be carried out. But let's now just look. Uh, tomorrow's Wednesday. We're recording here on Tuesday, February 9th. Sorry, April 9th. Tomorrow we get the Obama budget. Well, what are the two main things? The first is the introduction of the chained consumer price index, the chained CPI. This is the death of a thousand cuts for the economic rights of the American people. This is a way to uh, essentially deprive people of their economic rights. The chained CPI does this. It is a way to understate, massively understate, the real level of inflation. Now, this system that we have is already understating the real level of inflation. That goes back to Michael Boskin and the Bush the Elder administration 20 years ago. But tomorrow, Obama is going to declare a new phase in that war. And we have got to counter him, one of our main goals here. We'll be back in just a minute. Webster Topley Program, Unbound Radio. Welcome back to this world premiere edition of the Webster Topley program on Unbound Radio. So the bottom line of uh, this introductory broadcast, we're in a world economic depression. It's worse than the 1930s. And if you remember anything about the 1930s, it goes a little bit like this. There are three steps. First comes economic depression. Then comes dictatorship in the form of fascism, union busting, severe austerity, depriving people of their rights. And then... You get a world war. Now, all of those elements coexist to some extent, but there are basically three phases. If you don't like repression, if you don't like totalitarianism and the police state, you damn well better have a recovery program. And I don't mean the Paul Tard program, which says, let's have an immediate deflationary crash and uh, liquidate stocks, liquidate bonds, liquidate the farmer, liquidate real estate, liquidate labor, liquidate, liquidate, liquidate hope that you survive, and then hope that there's going to be an economic recovery. It, it won't last that long. You'll have a fascist coup long before the end of that process. That's the irony of libertarianism, is they claim to be anti-fascist, but everything they do brings the moment of fascist power 
closer. That goes for Bruning in the 1930s and for the Paul Tards and related people of today. So as we go into this depression, remember, as long as you've got 30 million unemployed and all the social instability that come with that, you're going to have tendencies towards dictatorship. Absolutely. And the only way to stop that dictatorship is not to go around fighting every little TSA agent, every little cop, every little snooper, whatever it is. You've got to go right for that issue. Create the 30 million new jobs here in the United States, 40 million plus in Europe. And indeed, the U.S. figure may be higher than 30 million. But 30 million would get you back to some kind of normalcy. If you don't want to do that, you're essentially refusing to fight dictatorship. You're going to say, I'm going to sit here with my uh, libertarian uh, von Hayek and von Mises or others say, I'm going to sit here uh, with my devotion to Barky Obama or my, uh, my nostalgia for Zuccotti Park and Occupy. That's all pathetic. It's time to get out there. Now, t- tomorrow, Obama will do two things. He will say, first of all, we're going to have the chain CPI, the chained consumer price index. Um, 20 years ago, Michael Boskin, this crackpot uh, charlatan economist working for Bush the Elder, already set up a system which vastly underestimates the real inflation. What they're trying to do is to stop the cost of living escalator, the cost of living adjustment that's built into Medicare, but also veterans benefits and a whole series of other things. Disability payments, too. These are the people who need it the most. So Obama, the creature of the banks, Obama, who decided that his function is to stand between the Wall Street parasites and the pitchforks of the citizens out there, Obama is now saying, let's shift more cost of the depression to the average working family through the payments for the elderly, their medical care, their pension. But then it gets to be other things because those are the ones that have the biggest constituency. 80%, 80%, four-fifths of the U.S. population says, hands off my economic rights, hands off Social Security and Medicare. Isn't it ironic that we don't have a political party that's willing to defend those economic rights when 80% of the people uh, are interested in keeping them? This is where I say there's a political opportunity. That's what I'm into. Let's try to see ways in which that political void could be filled. Because if you come forward with a party that says, we are going to defend the economic rights of the American people against the Paul Tards and against Obama and so forth, then uh, I think that has a lot of potential. Uh, if, if anything does, it's got, to be, it's got to be that. So tomorrow it will be the change CPI. As the years go by, the Social Security benefit gets to be less and less and less because it's going to be eroded by the inflation, which is uh, certainly in the system. The inflation itself is not a problem at the current rate, but uh, if you don't compensate for it in the pension, in the fixed income area of the pensions and so forth, then it becomes a big problem. That is the death of a thousand cuts. That's Newt Gingrich's old plan, let it wither on the vine. The other thing that Obama is going to do is to say 400 billion in additional cuts to Medicare. Now, that's on top of Obama's 700 billion in cuts to Medicare, which is part of Obamacare. So that gets us up to 1.1 trillion in Medicare cuts. Now, Obama, of course, argues, the White House argues, that comes out of the payments made to providers, to doctors, to hospitals, to laboratories, and so forth. But any clear-thinking person, anyone who is not clinically insane, can see that in a program, even the size of Medicare, to take $1.1 trillion out of the program, you cannot simply say that goes to big pharma and people that were treated so well by Bush the Younger, and we're going to take that back. No, no, it's going to be much worse. You're going to shut down a lot of smaller hospitals, a lot of doctors' practices, a lot of labs. And a lot of doctors simply cannot continue if the level of remuneration, the level of payment in Medicare keeps going down. This has to stop. Only Obama could get away with this, uh, and, but let's hope he can't. Bush, mad dog Bush the Younger, in his second term, tried to attack Social Security as privatization, 
and I'm sure he had other plans for Medicare. Uh, Obama is trying it in a slightly more sophisticated, more devious, demonic way, as he usually does. We have got to mobilize against it. When you say, what can I do? I'm an isolated individual. Well, you're not. The United Front Against Austerity is there for you. Go to my website, tarpley.net. Tarpley.net will get you to uh, the United Front Against Austerity, againstausterity.com or .org, I guess it is. And there you can find things to do. One obvious thing to do is get on Twitter. We need Twitter brigades, Twitter armies. Get on Twitter and attack Obama. Say, no, you're not going to be able to take our economic rights away. I wonder what, what's a Paul Todd going to do? A Paul Todd would say, oh, Obama's doing a good thing. He's stripping the American people of their economic rights and he's fighting against big government. Well, that shows the bankruptcy of that position. So get on there and say, and if you don't know what to write, go to Webster G. Tarpley. Go to my Twitter page, my Twitter feed. Find out what I'm doing. If you like that, then retweet that, rephrase it, recast it, do whatever you want. You think you can do better, good, try it. The more the merrier. So a Twitter brigade, a Twitter army. The other one is Operation Take Back the Airwaves. Operation Take Back the Airwaves. Every morning on C-SPAN, there's Washington Journal. It's a call-in. Uh, you got a phone, you got a TV, you can do something. You can reach several million people on Washington Journal. It's generally about economics, not always. Uh, then there are other programs, Lin Limbaugh, Hannity, O'Reilly, the uh, NPR, uh, Diana Reem show in the mornings, most weekdays, in particular Friday with the domestic and international hours. They're on there. You can get on there. You can, you can contribute to this. You can denounce the mania of the Washington elites, the oligarchs, left oligarchs and right oligarchs here in Washington, D.C., who think that it's time for the American working people to pay for their depression. Well, no. Sorry, guys. It's not time for any such thing. The other issue we have to look at, in addition to this dire economic situation, and we we can uh, we'll be getting into the international economics, the uh, the Japanese currency policies, the Cyprus crisis, the artificial crisis of the euro created by Anglo-American attack on the euro. Very obviously, uh, we got to talk about that as much as we can. But let's just look at the international uh, arena with the trip of Senator John Forbes Kerry of Skull and Bones into the Middle East going to Israel and uh, meeting with the Syrian opposition, the death squads, the Al-Qaeda people that the U.S. is, is uh, unabashedly supporting. I think the Syrian situation looks worse than it ever has. In this sense, I think we're closer to the creation of buffer zones. This was reported last Wednesday in the Washington Post, a buffer zone at the corner where uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria meet, one buffer zone there, and another one at the corner where uh, Jordan, Iraq, and Syria meet. So two buffer zones. In order to give a safe haven to these death squads and al-Qaeda terrorists who are the main force, the al-Nusra brigade, uh, al-Qaeda in Syria has reiterated today that al-Nusra is their gambit in, in Syria, uh, that's going to be a buffer zone. Uh, the, this buffer zone, however, will come under attack from the Syrian Air Force. No sovereign state can allow the creation of a terrorist haven. I thought, I thought the U.S. policy in Afghanistan was, to, was not to permit terrorist havens, but it looks like these buffer zones are going to do it, as if all of Libya were not enough, which is now a terrorist safe haven. So they're going to have this. Uh, it will come under air attack. They will try to fight back with man pads, right, with the shoulder-held surface-to-air missiles that may work, may not work. But then at, the, at that point, the U.S., the British, the French, NATO can point to the inability of the rebels to protect the, uh, the buffer zones with these anti-aircraft means, and they'll say, well, we have to have a no-fly zone. A no-fly zone over those areas obviously presupposes a generalized bombing attack on all of Syria. Destroy airports, airfields, radars, SAMs, any kind of air defense, and so forth. And with that, then you're in the soup. What will Putin do? I don't know, but he will respond. I don't think with war, but with something 
that will be quite unpleasant. Now, this is one area. What, what is the urgency with Syria? Well, if Netanyahu and company are loudly proclaiming that it's time to attack Iran, it is indispensable to finish off Syria before you go on to Iran. That's just elementary logic. And since Syria has put up this gallant, magnificent struggle of self-defense, and I was there on the ground in November 2011 to see it, the problem now is that they, they thought that Syria would have fallen long ago. It's screwing up their timetable of aggression. So they'll be looking for pretexts. Watch out for Gulf of Tonkin. Watch out for false flag. Watch out for provocations. Right? Watch out for... Gleivitz radio station uh, examples, and we've had those in Syria already. Watch out for alleged use of chemical weapons and so forth. That will then be a step towards isolating Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and then going for the end game in the Middle East, which is to wipe out the Iranian uh, government of Ahmadinejad. There are going to be elections in Iran in June. That is when they want a new color revolution. To start and attempt to overthrow the Iranian government using tweeters, using the groovy, uh, internet-oriented golden youth, uh, it's not enough against the organized forces inside Iran, Iran. So we'll see what happens with that. How does the Northwest Asia, Northeast Asia compare to this? Well, North Korea. North Korea is this regime with deep problems. They respond on profile you want to goad them, you can goad them publicly, goad them privately. I'm sure that's all being done. You fly a B-2 bomber over South Korea, you're going to get a rise out of them. And that's what you're seeing, except this has now gone on beyond the usual, right? These foreigners have been told by the DPRK, the North, to leave the South, the ROK. And we've had um, all the bluster on both sides that you've seen. What is the point of this? Well... If you're going to have an, and this is, it takes us back to the eve of the Iraq war 10 years ago. If the U.S. is going to attack somebody in the Middle East, then it is uh, part of the imperial management to solidify and consolidate the position in Northeast Asia. In other words, you've got to get a big crisis with North Korea going as the pre precursor to a war in the Middle East. Why? Because you want to scare the hell out of South Korea, ROK, and Japan. Scare the hell out of them so that they have to cling to the skirts of the U.S. They've got to be hugging the U.S. for dear life in the face of a nuclear threat from North Korea. Uh, and that's how you prepare. Not that there's going to be a war in Northeast Asia, though there might be, but mainly to keep them solidified. And then you go and start your war in the Middle East. We'll be back in a minute on... The Webster Tarpley Program, Unbound Radio. Welcome back to this final segment of the world premiere broadcast of the Webster Tarpley Program here on Unbound Radio. And we're delighted to be with uh, Unbound Radio, Shepard Ambellis and his fine staff, providing, I think, a necessary uh, alternative supplement to... Uh, so much of what passes. Uh, this uh, network uh, impressed me because it's not tied to the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And you'll find a lot of so-called libertarians who pretend to be overcoming the left-right dichotomy. But then you look, they're tied to the worst reactionary Republican candidates, the Paltards, whose economics represents an even more genocidal version of the killer cuts, the killer austerity represented by Obama and the Wall Street Democrats. So break out of that useless paradigm, and we hope to contribute to that uh, in this program. So uh, these two crises, right? obviously the, the crisis has a, an international economic uh, dimension. Let's just at least mention this, right? Um, in order to show you that it's a world economic breakdown crisis. It's a breakdown crisis of the imperialist order. By the way, we, want, we don't talk about new world order here. We talk about uh, imperialism. It is the U.S.-British imperialism. New world order, uh, not maybe the best term, uh, a term invented by 
the Skousens by uh, Cleon Skousen, the Mormon FBI agent, I believe, was the first person to put that term into circulation. The New World Order implies somehow that in addition to London and Wall Street, there's a place at the table for Paris, well, maybe half a seat for Paris, for Berlin, maybe half a seat for Rome, quarter seat. But then when you get to Tokyo, right, half a seat. What about Moscow? No seat. What about Beijing? There's no seat for them. It's not a world order. It is the Anglo-American imperial system created after 1945. And the struggles that we see are not so much the attempt to create the system because it exists. The things that we see around us are the symptoms of the death agony of this moribund system, which is uh, a straitjacket for humanity. And again, we don't need it. If we didn't have an empire, real wages in the United States would be higher. Uh, economic well-being would be far greater if we did not have an empire. And the obvious, the obvious dimension is war. But even beyond war, why is it that the U.S. economy has been deindustrialized? Why have we lost two-thirds of our standard of living in the last 30, 40 years, say since about 1967, 1971, when Nixon ended the International New Deal. He ended the Bretton Woods system, which was the triumph of the Franklin D. Roosevelt New Deal, the New Deal for the world. That was the best economic monetary system the world has ever known before or since. Highest levels of economic growth, growth and employment employment, rising living standards, rising longevity for the world from 1944 to 1971. So that all works, destroyed by Nixon under the guidance of Milton Friedman and other Austrian and Chicago reactionaries. In effect, 1971 was the deregulation of the international currency system. And out of that grows risk and out of risk grow the derivatives. So uh, New World Order, not the best term. It's really just the old Anglo-American empire and its various uh, satellites. And Putin is not invited to the table. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, and, of course, third world, you know, the developing countries, forget it. The, the reason why we have this war emergency, why, what, what is it that has changed? Well, it's the BRICS, uh, I would say, the one big thing that we can point to. We've just had another BRICS summit. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And that group of five uh, states, uh, no matter what the technicalities of their origin, they are now in the process of creating a worldwide alternative to the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund, of course, not anymore what it was under Bretton Woods. It's gotten much, much worse which a lot of people have pointed to. Now we have the International Monetary Fund essentially strangling countries. Right? All the austerity in Europe is carried out by a troika of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, European Central Bank, and European uh, Union. And in the, in the developing countries, it's straight IMF. Right? They come attacking uh, Egypt, let's say, or Libya, right? setting up destabilizations. The BRICS have announced the creation of an alternative to that. For the first time in many, many decades since the fall of the Soviets, there's another game in town. You don't like the IMF. Try the BRICS Development Bank. Now, the BRICS Development Bank has been slow to come forward. It's not capitalized enough. It was supposed to be uh, $25 billion uh, per member. It's less, but it's going to be $50 billion. So if you're Egypt, you now have an alternative. So that's why... The, the war danger comes from the fact that there's an actual challenge to the Anglo-American world system. And that's the kind of stuff we'll be talking about in future broadcasts. So in the meantime, Topley.net, Topley.net, Webster G. Talk.